All right. I'm getting the I'm getting the, the body language from the the bosses to to start. So uh, um, it's my pleasure on this wonderful Friday afternoon. First of all, thanks for coming on a wonderful Friday afternoon with such nice weather outside. Um, to listen to Dr. Mohammed Hussein Dabagi um, uh, speak, um, I'm introducing um, Mode um, uh, as a colleague, as a supervisor. Um, but also as part of the seminar series, because uh, Dr. Dabagi has been with uh, our group for maybe at least three years. At least three years. Yeah. Um, as a as a postdoctoral fellow, after working in the lab of Dr. Ravi Selvaganapathy uh, for his PhD um, in biomedical engineering, which before that he did his master's uh, in engineering. Uh, at the Sharif University of Technology in Iran, um, and really, it's been a, it's a wonderful journey with with Mode over the past three years. I am not an engineer; um, I am a physiologist, pharmacologist, immunologist, and the tolerance that Mode has shown me with uh, you know bringing me up to speed on some of these technologies, but opening my eyes to the the possibilities has been excellent. And I think, you know, this is an example of one plus one equals three, three. or 10. Um, and I look forward to hearing what you have to say about the work um, that's been going on in the tissue engineering for advanced medicine lab mode. Please take okay, it. thank you for introduction, Jay. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, as Jay mentioned, I joined uh, Dr. Jeremy Hirota in 2019 as a postdoc flow. Our lab is uh, located at Fire Institute for Respiratory Health at St. Joe's Hospital and Department of Medicine at McMaster. Our aim was to develop in vitro models for lungs, to, to model lungs using dynamic and advanced uh, fabrications. Before starting and, and giving uh, some talk about our work, I want to just uh, give you a background why we need, in general, why we need to model an organ or tissue. Uh, for different purposes, I want to just simplify to three. One is we want to study a healthy or a diseased tissue or an organ to understand how a, a healthy tissue works or how a disease works. And also, when we have an understanding, we can develop the new drugs. And the third one is kind of the futuristic purpose of in vitro models, when we can have models based on patient samples, where we can develop personalized medicine. because. For many diseases, especially chronic disease, uh, doctors and patients need to work together to find the best medication for patient. And that's going to be time consuming, energy consuming, especially impacts person's life. What kind of models now available and what kind of models we use in the lab or in our facility? We have, in general, we have in vivo or animal model. And, but before getting to animal models, typically, in vitro models, which can be a tissue culture plate when we have a hard plastic surface where we can see cells can be used. It can get more complex. We can add some complexity. It can go from 2D uh, dimension to 3D environments. But uh, all these models can be used to study different drugs or different healthy or disease tissue. I want to also emphasize on this because this is kind of the most uh, more important uh, in, uh, motivation behind developing all these in vitro models. To develop a drug, typically we need to spend a lot of time and we need to study lots of drug candidates. It starts from lab, from chemistry lab, biochemist labs. Uh, it needs to uh, different hundred thousand of uh, drug candidates will be studied. When there are some uh, good uh, successful drug candidates, it goes through in vitro studies and then it goes for in vivo or animal studies. Typically, there is a back and forth between these two stages and there are lots of failure. When a drug seems promising, uh, it gets approval that goes to clinical study. In clinical study, typically there is three stages, stage one to stage three. But unfortunately, as many studies shows, many of these drug candidates fail in the, fa the first phase or the second phase of the studies. If you look at the timeline, it may take 10 to 14 years. It can cost up to two, three billion dollars. And all this time and cost will, at the end, when we have a drug that hits the markets, 
will be added to the cost of a drug. So that's one of the reasons why when we have a drug in the market, that drug is very expensive. Not everyone can afford it. So the whole idea is to come with a better way to develop drugs that is way cheaper that everyone can afford it. The reason is from animal study to clinical phase, there is a huge uh, difference between animal biology and human biology. And there is nothing to fill this gap. And the new advance in vitro models is aiming to fill this gap that we're developing more complex, more realistic model that can mimic human physiology. I wanna talk about the lung because that's our focus. Lung, uh, all the organ and tissue in general are complex to model, but I don't know, we are, I don't know, maybe we are not lucky. Lung is one of the most complicated ones for many reasons. Uh, one thing is the geometry and the shape of the lung. In lungs, we have many different sizes, many tissues. We have airways, we have bronchial, that we have air channels with the size of, just in the order of millimeters to down to micrometers. And all these airways, bronchial needs, if we wanna have a comprehensive lung model, we need to include all these dimension and geometry in our model. And that was the only geometry of the lung, how a lung looks like, how complex it is. But when you look at the composition of a lung, if that even gets more complicated and it gets even more uh, uh, worse for modeling, for developing a model. In lungs, we have more than 60 different cell types. The cell, the lung tissue composition from alveoli to airway to trachea, is, uh, is very different. Somewhere it's a stiff, somewhere it's a soft, and that all, that all need to be included. So that brings us to this question. If, okay, we wanna model a lung, but we cannot include all these models. It doesn't seem possible and realistic. What can we do? What we can do is to simplify the question and simplify it to parameter that we can include in one model. We can start with the size, so that size matters here. So if we have, uh, we have, we are dealing with the conducting zone or respiratory zone where we have the gas transfer. Uh, that can be defined by type of disease or phenomenon in the lung that we want to study. We can also look at what kind of disease we want to uh, we want to model. So in that disease, what cell is uh, the most important one, or what cell types we need to include? what kind of uh, 3D environment of cells we need to consider, uh, the composition of ECM, how, uh, what kind of uh, composition should be. Then we can decide if we wanna have a static uh, in vitro models or dynamic in vitro models. If it's dynamic, what kind of dynamic forces we are talking about, airflow, perfusion, or breathing. If uh, I wanna just give a brief, uh, into a background about different lung cell culture that available and people use in the lab. The most simple one is uh, uh, the one on the top on the left. This is called sub, uh, submerged cell culture model. Here we have cells on a tissue culture plate. It could be different material, but typically it's a hard plastic. The cells are on top, we have media and the cells have a, exp cells experience a 2D environment. The other, a little bit more complex model, it called uh, ALI model or transfer insert model. So there is a plastic uh, device, kind of the tools that goes inside the valves and the cells can be seated on one side. At the bottom, we have a membrane, a porous membrane. And because we have this geometry, we can remove media from the top side here and expose the cells to air. That's an important parameter for epithelial cells in our lungs, that's where our cells are ex directly exposed to air, and that kind of uh, model that uh, function of the lungs. If we get a little bit more complex, we can have co-culture model, we can have different cell types, we can have cell types, different cell types in a hydrogel uh, beside each other, we can have them in a transfer insert on one side or have having them on both sides of the transfer inserts. If we, more advanced and more recent models are organic chip or microfluidic devices. These organic chip devices, specifically lung on a chip devices, they aim to model some function of lung, like breathing. Uh, 
the way they look like, they typically have two microfluidic channels. One is designed for air. The other one is designed for to act as a blood channel. And these two channels are separated by a porous membrane. We can see epithelial cells on one side, endothelial cell or fibroblast cells on the other side, and have air flowing on one side and media flowing on the other side. And this organic chip can be also, the membrane can be stretched in a way to simulate breathing. More recent models are 3D or bioprinted uh, construct for modeling lungs. So as you know, 3D printing is a method that deposit material on top of each other, layer by layer. This method can be used to add geometry, different geometry, complex geometry, and hollow structures. Uh, at, at our lab, so what we try to do, let, uh, we try to be first realistic, that we cannot add all these complications in one model. So we broke it down to few parameters. We, we understood that the dynamic forces are very important. So that's one of it because lung is dynamic organ. We all, the lung, we inhale air and exhale air. So we always have breathing. So that needs to be included. Also, we knew that most of the material that has been used for modeling lungs, they don't represent the lung environments. So we try to also develop a biomaterial that is well suited for studying lung. For dynamic forces, two forces are very important. One is flow and perfusion. So the perfusion could be just blood going through the vessels or could be air going through the airways or uh, alveoli. And also breathing motion is very important to be considered. So that was also one thing that we included in our models. Next for materials, the materials, so the lung composition is different, in healthy tissue is different, in disease tissue is different. So the material, the biomaterial should be tunable, not only by the chemical properties, also mechanical properties to uh, represent healthy or diseased lung tissues. This brings us to our first work. This was published in ACS Biomaterial Science and Engineering. So in the, here we try to uh, uh, develop a method, a fabrication method is, which is more, way more cost effective compared to the conventional or more common uh, organic chip devices. Here we use a geography benchtop device. So it's a, uh, it's a cutter, it's a cutter that's not very expensive. It's just a few hundred dollars. Every lab can purchase it. And we use adhesive, uh, adhesives to create uh, organic chip or pattern cells. I explain how, it, how this method works. Uh, Double-sided adhesives, so these are adhesives that pressure sensitive. They can uh, stick different material together. They come in a different properties. Uh, usually they, there is a carrier film. There are two layers of adhesive and two liners. And the way we use it, we use it to create the pattern cells and use that cell patterning for wound healing assay. We can adjust the depths of our cutter to just uh, cut the top layer and create our desired shape. And then when we see the cell, the cells grow everywhere, they become confluent. And when they are confluent, we can remove the top lining layer and create the pattern that we are looking for. So in this case, we wanted to model wound healing assay. So we were looking to create a gap in a confluent cell area that represent a wound in a lung. In other models, we wanted to make lung on a chip easier and easier to fabricate in a lab and also microfluidic devices. We see the cell, we assemble the device in this direction. We had a, por a porous uh, membrane similar to the membranes that has been, that's used in transfer inserts. We pattern this layer, the adhesive layer. We see this layer after removing the lining layer, we pattern the cells and we could attach it to a PDMS. So that's a silicon-based material, which is commonly used in microfabrication and microfluidics to expose it to flow. We can have a, another channel underneath that membrane and then pattern the, the cells, remove it, and then attach, attach another layer on top that creates long on a chip device. This was the way it looked like. So the cells were growing on the membrane, on the lining layer, everywhere. After removing it, we just only pattern it on, uh, on the channels. 
in the first step, we just uh, want to find kind of the optimum accuracy for our work. There are many adhesives outside. Some of them have a biomedical label on it, but some of them are just uh, uh, industrial adhesive that everyone uses in the industry. We had few options, so we just narrowed it down to these few. We tested two different common cell, long cell types in our lab, just because also cells uh, have a different response to environment they are exposed to, and then compared with the tissue culture plates. We culture the cells and perform a cell viability here. As you see, uh, cells, some cells attach to one adhesive very well, but as when the other cell didn't attach very well. But just to be able to more characterize this assay, we also perform some cytotoxicity uh, assay, like LDH or interleukin-6 expression of the cells that represent if the cell feels some stress in the environment. As you see here, so some of these assays show uh, most of the adhesive didn't have uh, toxic, in, toxic impact on the cells, but for, ins for instance, this case, the cell didn't adhere very well. So we put the data together and then uh, pick one or two of these adhesive for future for the next experiment we perform. Next, we want to see how small we can get. So we know with the with this cutter, we can cut and create shapes with a different geometry, but just we want to see using this method how small we can go. And that could give us a resolution that we can use for our experiment. So we try to cut channels with a different widths from 1000 micrometer down to 200 micrometer. And then we compare the target width uh, we had with the achieved widths we here. And that showed us there was a close relate, there was a close relationship between what we targeted and what we achieved, and we could go down to 200 micrometer. We also want to see how complex geometry we can pattern using these methods. So we try to create different letters, different shapes. Here we can see we wrote then here the lab, McMaster, and try to, after having the cell being confluent, remove the lining layer, create the shape, and then look and then image the cells. It doesn't look perfect, but it's good enough for many applications. And here, as you see, even in the M letter here, the, the, width, width, the width is around 10 cells. So that shows it has a very good resolution for the app, especially for the application we're looking for. Then we use this uh, cell patterning method to create a wound healing assay. So wound healing assay is a common assay that uh, that is done in many uh, applications, but in also in lungs, very common. And it, many of diseases starts from abnormal wound healing process. Here we uh, create a pattern adhesive, then we seed the cell and let the cell be a, become confluent. And when the cells uh, were confluent, we remove the lining layer and create the gap to model the wound. So comparing to the traditional method, so the traditional method is called a scratch assay. So in a scratch assay, they, we just let the cells to become confluent. Then we use a tool, it can be a pipette tip or something to create uh, a wound, create a gap here. As you see in these two images, this gap can vary. And when we perform both assay and compared what we achieve, you see there is a huge variation for a scratch assay. It can vary from 600 to uh, 1100, 1100 uh, micrometer, but for using our method, we could achieve very close to what we aimed for. Uh, that was 800 micrometer. Then we want to see if we add some reagents to our wound healing assay, what happens? If our wound healing assay is sensitive enough to respond to something like epidermal growth factor or EGF. So we had our wounds. We had samples without any EGF supplement, and some of them were uh, uh, treated with EGF. As you see here, those that uh, after 40 hours, the samples that were treated with EGF, the wound closed, uh, completely closed, and also there was some migration of cells toward the outside. When we quantified, uh, the metabolic activity of cells was higher for uh, EGF uh, for EGF treated sample, because we had more, that was one reason we had more cells, but also 
the wound closed uh, way faster than uh, not treated samples. Also, we wanted to see if we can use our assay, we can perform a medium or low throughput assay and also test sensitivity. If we have different concentration of EG of what happens, if our assay is sensitive enough to give us different response based on the concentration. So we came up with a smaller model, a smaller wound here, because we wanna just fit it in a 24 well plate. So at the same time, we created 24 uh, wound healing assay in a well plate. And then we treated with different concentration of EGF. At the same time, we had four replicates for each concentration, and then samples uh, had uh, showed different response. We saw that at this concentration, four nanogram per ml, so that at higher concentration than four nanogram per ml, we didn't observe significant change. But this, in overall, showed that our uh, wound healing assay has since it can be used for studying the sensitivity of reagents for the uh, difference for these cell types. Finally, uh, we use this model to create a long on a chip. As I mentioned earlier, so here we had cells, epithelial cells growing on a membrane and on this adhesive. By removing the lining layer, we create our pattern and the channels. Then we look at how the permeability works. We had one assembled device where we seeded the cell and another device that we use our method and then look at the permeability, there was no difference, significant difference. So that shows there was no leakage. And also we look at the burst pressure. So that shows the strengths of the bonding after, because when we have the, uh, the adhesive, everything in the cell culture media, everything become wet and the bonding quality is, is something very important. So after a few days, I think one or two weeks after cell culture, we haven't observed any difference between the burst pressure between the control and our samples. We look at the permeability of the cells and the permeability uh, decrease as we expected for epithelial cells because they are supposed to provide barrier functions. And that's what they did here. Uh, then this is the, our next work. So where, as you remember, I mentioned that beside the dynamic forces, we also need to develop a better bio, uh, biomaterial for modeling lungs. Here we aim to come up with a process to deserterize human lung tissue that can be used for different applications from 2D application to 3D applications. So that was our purpose. We wanted to remove all the cellular component because they have a DNA material and they have, so they should be removed. But at the same time, we wanted to isolate uh, extracellular metrics or the protein or ECM in this, uh, around the cells. So we call, so uh, in the next few slides, I will call this DCM or decelerized extracellular metrics. And the way it works, we receive long tissue samples. We uh, slice it to a small pieces. We had few washes. We use different reagents to make sure we're removing all the cellular components and we just preserve the ECM of the, the, ECM of the long tissues. This typically takes a week. And then after that, we have just ECM left over. We lyophilize it, remove the, all the water content and turn it to a powder. Here we confirm that uh, the, the cellular component DNA is removed. So the blue mark you see here, they are the DNAs. On the left, we have tissues. On the right, we have DCM. So they were removed after all the washes. We also show that the proteins like collagen will be left there So because that's something that we want to have it in our uh, bio ink. We also look at elastin here, that elastin also, some, some of elastin will be preserved after all these washes and process. Uh, what we get after all this process, it's a, it's a material in the powder shape uh, that which cannot be used by itself. So we need to process it, turn it to kind of liquid or solution that we can use. One, one of our goal was to use it as a hydrogel to digest this material. This is a protein-based material. We use a pepsin, which is an enzyme that breaks down the peptide binds. We use it acidic environment. And at the first step, we adjust the pH. We want to make sure the pH is close to two because that's the optimum enzymatic pH for pepsin. We process it for 72 hours. 
and I did it at room temperature. When it's digested, it, uh, it's kind of homogenized solution, but there are some, some parts of it that is not fully dissolved. So we remove those undissolved material. Then we wanted to initiate gelation. So we have to uh, adjust the pH. So because the majority of material in that uh, DECM solution that gels is collagen and collagen gel that uh, neutralize pH so we had to neutralize the pH. We use sodium hydroxide. All the process should be done and on ice should be cold. And when the solution is ready, it can be poured in a different mold or different shape that we want. And then when we put an incubator at 30 degrees Celsius and we wait for 30, at least 30 minutes, it turns to gel as you see here. We try different concentration and this is the SCM image show the fibral structure of these hydrogels. Uh, we'll look at the gelation of the gelation kinetics of these hydrogels. Uh, we try different concentration. We want to see at yeah, different concentration what happens. Uh, we measure the absorbance at 405 nanometer. We add them in a 96 volt plate and measure the absorbance, normalize it, and look and it look like uh, like this. The higher concentration, it gels a little bit faster. All these four concentration gel. There was a little bit difference. It wasn't uh, that huge, uh, but all, they gelled around 30 minutes. The next was, we wanna make sure they have the good cell viability and the cell, different cell types can survive in this uh, digested DCM gel. So we use two primary cells. We use primary human lung fibroblast, and we also use primary human bronchial epithelial cells. For fibroblasts, because fibroblasts, they reside in tissue, they experience a treaty environment. So we encapsulate the, the fibroblasts inside the gel. We use different concentration of hydrogel, as I mentioned, and the fibroblasts contract the samples at different ratio when they experience different uh, concentration. For epithelial cells, the epithelial cells have a 2D environment. So instead of adding them to the gel, we form the gel and then we add them on top of the hydrogels. So both cells showed very good uh, cell viability on these hydrogels. As I mentioned in the previous slide, you saw some uh, the hydrogels, uh, the cells contracted the hydrogels, and here you can see uh, how they how they contracted over a few days at different concentration. The 20 milligram per ml hydrogel they contracted less compared to the others, but the other concentration they had significant contraction. And the lowest, uh, the lowest concentration gave us, gave us the highest contraction. Then uh, beside forming hydrogel, these uh, DECM material could be, can be used for coating surfaces to improve the cell attachment and cell proliferation. Uh, typically, some cells like epithelial cells, they don't have very good attachment on tissue culture plates, so it's better to first treat the surface with some ECM-based proteins like collagen, fibrinic, and laminin, but uh, DECM could be also another option. So here, what we tried to do was to coat the surface uh, that epithelial cells that we want to sit have DECM material on the surface. As you see here, we tried different concentration. The, the concentration was lower because we only did coating here, and we compared with the sample that didn't have any uh, coating. As you see, the cell attachment improved significantly just because of having the ECM coated on a surface. Uh, as you, as coating may change the surface, we just did take a look at the surface and see here the water contact angle reduce a little bit. So that shows the surface became more hydrophilic, but you can also see form some collagen fibers in both AFM and SCM images, you can see those fibers. We want to also look at some functionality of the functionality of cells because epithelial cells are supposed to provide barrier function uh, in our innate immune system. So that's one of the main uh, function of epithelial cells. So here we want to see if we have some we have surfaces without any coating but have the ECM coating if the barrier function improves. Here shows the tear measurement. So that's the resistance uh, in the cell culture media from apical side to base, basal side of the cells. 
with having DCM coating this improved, but it was, uh, it was better at one milligram per milliliter. We didn't look closer why the concentration was an important factor, but that, what, that played a role here. Also, we look at permeability. So we add a dye with fluorescent tag on one side and look, measure the concentration on the other side. Uh, all three DECM coated surfaces improve this uh, barrier function of epithelial cells. Uh, and there was for one milligram per ml, uh, it's quoted surface uh, perform a little bit better than the others two. Then here I wanna talk about our next work where we try to uh, bring dynamic force and other, and other dynamic forces in our in vitro models. Uh, we try to develop an open source system that can be used for stretching uh, cells and also lung tissues. We wanted to have it modular and open sources for a few reasons. So that these are the reasons we had. We wanted to uh, model different model, uh, especially the breathing, different breathing patterns in a rest, in exercise, coughing, all these have a different patterns. We wanted to uh, have it, we wanted to have it in a way that uh, can simulate all these models. We wanted to have this machine in a way that works with different experiments. So we can run different samples at the same time for control for patient and have the same condition for all these samples. The modularity is one of the main criteria for was for us because that way we could use it for cells, we could use it for tissues. This kind of stretching device is present in the market. There are market, there are commercial device, but all of those devices were designed only for one purpose. If it works for cells, you cannot repurpose it for tissue. If it works with a microfluidic device, you cannot repurpose it for another uh, 2D or 3D cell culture. So we wanted to have it in a way that we can change it if we need it for tissue, if we need it for hydrogel, if we need it for cells. So that way it will, will be suitable for 2D, 3D uh, cell experiment. Also, uh, we, wanted, uh, we want to have it in a way that can be easily upgraded in the future because now we have uniaxial stretcher, but in the future, maybe we wanna change it or upgrade it that can be, uh, that, that won't be cost, a uh, very cost uh, way. The way we, uh, we did, the way we did it was we use open source system, Raspberry Pi and also Arduino. And we also have a custom made a PCB and most of the parts were purchased from different suppliers, but all of them does, all of them won't cost that much. And this is how it looked like. So we have, we have the modular, it's a uh, unit that operates the, the machines. And in a, this slide, I show how does it work. So just need to, but in this video, you can see how this machine works. So it, this is the interface. This is UI. You can, the user interact with the machines. It's, it tells you what the steps you need to take. And here's, you ha we have the machine. You can define what kind of uh, pattern you have. You have a square or sinusoid pattern. Before mounting our uh, samples, here we just do the 2D cell culture. We just wet the pins here just to facilitate mounting. Then we can define how much you want to stretch it here. Let's give it a second. So after putting all these chambers, you can come back to the software. You can choose what pattern you want. You can define the length of a stretch. It gives it, you can decide what kind of pattern if you want a different time at each step A, B, C, or D, and then how long you want to operate it. You then run it, it starts working and shows you how, uh, how the program works. So as I mentioned, I we wanted to have it very modular. We wanted to use it for submerged uh, 2D cell culture. We designed this PDMS silicon-based material, which is elastic. You can easily stretch it. We used, it can be used with long gun chip device or any organ chip devices. It doesn't need to be long, but at the same time, you can stretch it or perfuse it. 
it can be used with hydrogels. Uh, you can have hydrogels in a confined uh, microfluidic channel or in open chamber. And at the same time, you can stretch it or with the long tissues. Next, we wanna just show, uh, we wanna validate our system and show it works that if you stretch different cell culture models like 2D or 3D, it shows some uh, response in our cells. So here we have started with 2D cells with uh, fibroblast cells cultured on a coated uh, silicon surface. After four hours of a stretch and 20% strain, we observe upregulation of uh, a smooth muscle alpha actin fibers. So those are the fibers in cells. So typically we have actin fibers in cells, but when the cells are undressed, under stress, they uh, express that the, these fibers are gonna be expressed. So in normal cells, when we don't have stress cells, it won't be any alpha SMA or the level of alpha SMA will be uh, very low. And after four hours of a stretch, we observe this overexpression of alpha SMA. Then we form hydrogel inside microfluidic channel. So this is the way they look like. And then we look at also alpha SMA expression. In hydrogel, there was a greater increase in alpha SMA expression. One reason was because the cell were embedded in uh, high collagen hydrogel and hydrogel has this environment with a mechanical property close to long. The cells uh, was less uh, stress compared to the 2D environments, but uh, as we stretched the cells for 24 hours, 10 person strain, there was around three fold increase in alpha SM expression. So this show that we can use our cat stretcher to uh, stretch the hydrogels and express a biomarker that shows uh, a stress in the cells. We also look at uh, long tissue. So we cut long tissue samples, create long slices. So that's a very common in, vitro, in ex vivo model in, a, in many biology labs. So it's very complex because it consists of all the cell component in the lungs. But here we could cut it to a small slices, then stretch it for 24 hours and 20% strain. Uh, we had different donors and then we'll look at the alpha SMA expression using Western blood and there was elevation in alpha SMA expression. Uh, that was my presentation. I tried to keep it very brief. At the end, I want to thank you. Many people, I couldn't uh, put all people here, but especially Hirota Labs, Dr. Jeremy Hirota and the rest of the team, uh, Dr. Moran Mural, and we, we've been working for three years together. I learned a lot from him. And Dr. Shergol, uh, he's a doctor that gives us the samples, uh, and Dr. Boyang that helped us at the beginning of the project. And by that, I'd be happy to answer any question. Thank you very much, Mo. Uh, this presentation is open for any questions. All right. Two minutes for it. Uh, do you like this, the stretching uh, apparatus trapped in the I'm wondering because if you think if I think about like lung span and that um, it's not like a unidirectional extension. So does it make more sense to do like, like a circular motion with expansive structures that I think it does. And that was one of the comments we got when we submitted the paper. So it's not uniaxial. So if you look at the lung, everywhere in the lungs, they have a different cycle. Somewhere it's not uniform, somewhere it's less, somewhere it's more. But having it from all different directions seems very more realistic. But because of uh, it, this project took a long time and when we went through many steps, so that was our first choice. But we left it in a way that we can upgrade it uh, we can we can opt in the future for different uh, for more all directional kind of a stretch. Uh, we had some idea. So one thing was kind of three D stretch to stretch it on all three and also on Z, but that seems a little bit too ambitious. But I think for the next step is from both sides, and then if we can integrate another step and motor, then we can stretch from all two sides, four sides. Thank you.
We can do all those. So you can have like ten percent stretched and hold it, and then so that's programmable in the software. But I think for our experiment, we just continuously stretch twenty percent, then recoil again. I think that was what we did. So that's another area. So that's in the field. We don't know what's kind of optimum because breathing from person to person is different. In healthy people that we have asthma, they have they breathe in a different way. When you exercise, you have a different breathing pattern. So all those, all those will give us different biology. Which experiment? That was, uh, to be honest, that was kind of accidental. So we wanted to create organic chip device using these adhesives, but we realized you can create, you can pattern cells. And wound healing assay is a common assay. Because many diseases like fibrotic disease, it starts with abnormal wound healing process. When the wound healing doesn't go in the way that's supposed to go, it creates a stiff fibrotic tissue. And to test some drugs or to test early impact of some drugs or some reagents, wound healing assay is used. Uh, I didn't get the question. So that's that's a question you can answer with wood healing acid, but we just show that this method, this cell patterning has the resolution that can be used for wound healing assay. You can create the wound and then we also we only study the EGF. And uh, so that's a growth factor and the cell showed some response, but that definitely other reagents or other drugs can be used. Sure. <laughs> No, we haven't used hypoxia. Uh, and then finally, it would be again, I see that you tested uh, autobots in your, in your aims. Mm -hmm. And as you said in the beginning, there are many cell types in the run. Mm -hmm. Try the cell types, are they actually viable? Such things? Uh, not unfortunately. So, getting access to all, especially primary cells, are very difficult. So we have access to, we can get access to different cell types, but it should be some rationale behind it. One reason we use fibroblasts because we are interested in modeling lung fibrosis. And in lung fibrosis, fibroblasts are the cells that derive the whole disease. Not entirely the, the other cells, but it starts kind of with fibroblasts. So that's one of the reasons that we use fibroblast cells. And fibroblast cells are easier to extract from tissues, other cells, are more complex to extract from lung tissues. But uh, epith epithelial cells have some complexity and other cells, uh, it's kind of not our interest in our lab. Uh, go off of Joel's question. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of right out. If you were to add one immune cell um, in the context of fibrosis and wound healing, mm -hmm. what immune cell would you add and why? I... You, if I want to go with one, I would go. I would go with macrophages or specifically monocytes. If I because monocytes are the immune cell that's circulating in our body, we want to see if it uh, migrate to the uh, location of the fibrotic region and then it transfer and transfer to macrophages and also gives us some immune response. So that would be another cells, but that's another project maybe. <laughs> So that's a great question. You know, it's like, well, geez, there's like 60 cells you just talked about. You know, what, what? Then you answered, well, it needs to be a cell that makes sense. And that would be probably the next progression. Mm -hmm. Okay, if epithelial cells, you have fibroblasts, you throw in monocytes, differentiate the macrophage. It could be pro-fibrotic or, or not, pro-inflammatory or not. And we would be able to have different, and, and actually they communicate together. Don't. And just for my ignorance, I thought you mean the initial slide here, what the first is one? The category three and the HBEC. Oh, yeah. 
Those are both one both of them are I think human. One of them is ca cancer calitrate cancerous cell. The other one is immortal cell line. It's modified. Thank you. Oh, thank you for your question. Great. Uh, did you see some kind of orientation of the cell during expression? That's a very good question. That that was one thing we didn't look for at the beginning. We mostly look at alpha semi expression. That kind of came up in our the review of the paper. But typically, when there is a stretch, it should be some redirection of the cells. But we haven't looked for it. I don't think so. Well, I'm looking at I'm on it. I'm kind of thinking. I think there was some analysis that you attempted. Yeah. Uh, whether or not our images were optimally collected to enable that, um, but I don't think we really saw a clear signal with the orientation of the threat mm -hmm. and the alignment of the cells. But it's well reported in the literature that that happens with endothelial cells as well as after the month cells. Presumably, it's happened with lung fibroblasts. Is there a general question? Um, you know, with the fibroblasts that you showed, it was a um, contradiction in the environment. Could you think of any application for that? Because it's changing the climate. Yeah, we use one of those applications here. So I just jump to this slide. So that's, I just want to emphasize that's not a normal thing that ha should happen. So if it happens, our lung should contract and shrink and shrinks, but that's not a normal thing. But it can be leveraged for different applications like here. So here we had the microfluidic channel. It was a chamber. We fill it with collagen and cells and let the cells stay there for a few days. And because of the contraction, it formed this shape. But people use this this behavior, this phenomenon of fibroblast for different applications, but yes, it can be used. Can I ask you a question? <laughs> um, not from the from labor work, uh, from the early work. But so when you were looking at the one healing assay, you, know, you removed the, the sample and mm -hmm. then you allowed the cells to migrate. How did that compare in terms of the speed of healing versus when you create the, the scratch and then you allow it to heal. Okay. Uh, to be honest, I don't know. We haven't, I haven't looked at it, but I, I imagine it will be different because the surface is different. So when we remove the lining, the bottom surface is silicon, but in tissue culture plate is hard plastic. And for some, one of those cell lines, I realized this growth rate and also the migration rate was way higher. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering if there was any impact of the no, we haven't looked at it. We had another collaboration with uh, I forgot Dr. Kawangna. Sure. Yeah, Dr. Puri, Dr. Puri lab. So they did they use the magnetic uh, force to form the cell, the wound healing assay. When he performed the assay, the wound closure was around 24 to 40 hours. So it was the same time window, but he formed smaller wound gap compared to ours. Yeah, I think for um, this, that assay, um, having done it in a variety of ways, we've sort of seen the evolution of that assay over the years and the technologies related to it. Uh, you know, often, just for anyone who wants to think, oh, I'll do this in an assay, like the scratch assay, is extremely variable and, and hard to reproduce from lab to lab to user to user to plate to plate. Um, so just be mindful that if you do, I'm not saying you need to use our technique, but it's like just if you are going to use a scratch assay, you scratch that surface. If that's a surface coated plate that is promoting cell adherence and growth, you might never get any cells to go back. And that has nothing to do with the wound. It's just you scratched the surface and made it not healthy. So I'll just be mindful of that assay. Yeah, what, exactly. What the gap. Say again? The gap. The gap. Microns? The gap size? Uh, the one I created was around 800 micrometer. And your question is why? why? I think that was based on the scratch assay. The scratch assay, people would just use a pipette tip and then 
did that to see well what what did it end up being routinely. And then I went, mm -hmm. okay, well that's the benchmark. We'll, we'll benchmark. So one question: What do you had mentioned the three D structure of the lab? I guess it's one of the plans for your models. I guess. Mm -hmm. um, they remind me of the of the experiments that like Aaron Rodin's ever fish with the internetic nuclear vibration. I can actually try to look into that. Like mm -hmm. see if the notice when the cells are so compacted and things that we kill you, will be smooth along the cell cycle. And as a, as a readout for a healthy tissue and it's your talk. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get the the question exactly. I, I so so ultimately what you're saying is there's some nuclear the nucleus is so moving. Show that like when you have like that tissue and the cells are really like at the solar and you're thinking you know, Oh really a question so of like, nucleus. Yeah, like it's to the bottom mm -hmm. of the substrate mm -hmm. when you show the trends well. And then she can show me several fish at least. And I think also in in mice, what about having order that the nucleus during the cell cycle actually changes position. Okay. Mm -hmm. So and that's actually a very nice read up to see how the tissue is actually pairing in terms of homeostasis. That'll be a, an interesting read up for you guys to see that you put in the ink. So, so what? Um, it's, it's not. We haven't thought about that. No, we no. haven't discussed that. That's so, a microscopic challenge. Is, this zebra, is zebrafish work that you're describing? Initially, yes. I think it's been shown already on humans. Okay. Yeah. So maybe we'll have to have a conversation about the specific paper with that. But what I can say about in, in fibrosis and uh, some of Boris Hines' work, mm -hmm. work, where based on the microenvironment, the 3D microenvironment those cells are in, there is mechanical coupling of that microenvironment to the nucleus. And actually, depending on the stiffness of that microenvironment, it impacts how the nucleus responds. And then actually how they're, they're going as far as saying how that is programming the, the chromatin structure epigenetically. That's why I was asking about the nucleus. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely a nuclear cytoplasmic extracellular communication that can be coordinated in the 3D microenvironment. Stiff environment, Disease biochemistry, which you were talking about, yeah, yeah. versus different normal ECM, could lead to completely different epigenetic programming at the nucleus by what you're saying. Now, whether it moves or not, that will leave that to the microscopist uh, to help us out. I mean, I guess you guys also said, yeah, yeah, we tried, but we couldn't get some positive results. Yeah, it is, especially with hydrogels. Uh, you, you, you so different concentrations of DCM. Can you then manipulate the stiffness of these uh, hydrogel? Is that having an impact on cell behavior or biology? Mm -hmm. That's something I'll, so DCM itself, when we digest it, it doesn't give us a big window. There is a little bit difference in mechanical properties. So uh, with Jose group, we try to quantify it and it wasn't huge. It was like 100 Pascal difference something. So that's not a big enough to model a disease like fibrotic. But now we are trying to artificially play with that stiffness. So we have DCM in, uh, inside our hydrogel, but we add some stuff in it or make some changes that the difference is way higher. So if we go from healthy, which is around one kilopascal, but that's a young modulus to five, uh, 500, uh, five kilopascal or 10 kilopascal. So that's something we are trying to do now. I haven't, but I think there are some interests and there are other students, but topography based uh, surface is also impacted. We can mimic the stiff or soft environment for cells. So that could be another option. Okay, any other questions? Any questions online? There's, there's just never anyone online. <laughs> um, so with that, then I'll draw this, this talk to a close and thank Dr. Devagi for this presentation. Oh, thank you for the invitation. And, and thank you for the audience for the participation here.